it's a pleasure to be here. Excuse me. I'm sure I don't trip over any wires. Um, I have to go back to Arkansas, May 27th, so I have just one more month. And I'm glad to, anyway, glad to be out here and glad to be participating in Arab American Heritage Month. I'm not an Arab American, but I have lived in Lebanon for about 10 years and in Palestine for a year where I did uh, research for my book that Inaz uh, mentioned. And also I taught at the American University of Cairo for four years. Um, <clears throat> let me say in the outset about this title that what I'm going to do here today is make a rather quite modest claim um, with regard to music and the question of peace in Palestine and Israel. My point really is that there are some points of cultural convergence and cultural sharing between Palestinian Arabs and Israeli Jews. Now mainstream accounts, that is say most of what you would read about in the news or hear about, uh, about the conflict mostly underline that there is a kind of inherent opposition between Arabs and Jews and a conflict that has been going on maybe for hundreds if not thousands of years. And the unfortunate consequence of this sort of understanding of the issue is that it makes it seem as though Arabs and Jews have been at each other's throats forever, perhaps. Um, and it can also lead one to think that all there is to do about this is to throw up our hands and let them sort it out themselves. I want to present a quite different picture and a picture based on two propositions. First, that there are something I would call Jewish Arabs, or alternatively, Arabs of the Jewish faith and their offspring. So Jewish Arabs. And second, that there are examples of connection and collaboration between Palestinian Arab musicians and Israeli Jewish musicians and audiences. So I'm going to proceed today first by talking about Jewish Arabs and give you some examples of music made by them in Israel. There are other places they're making music, but I'm going to focus on Israel. And second, I will present some examples of Palestinian rappers who have collaborated with Jewish Israeli musicians and who have performed before Jewish audiences. So to reiterate, before getting going then, my claims for the potential that such cultural connections hold for the ultimate goal of peace are, again, quite modest. I mean, I'm not claiming that this is the way to peace. Uh, I don't, uh, but, but what I w would say is that, in fact, new political developments are going to have to take place in the area in the future if there is going to be any realistic prospects for peace. I mean, the prospects for peace right now actually do not look uh, very good. Anybody who knows anything about it would tell you that. You don't even have to know anything about it to, to think that. But popular music might play some sort of role in such developments if they occur. And the kinds of cultural connections, another point, uh, the, the kinds of cultural connections I'm discussing here today might also suggest possible avenues for different kinds of politics to emerge in future, different kinds of politics than we see um, today. So I want to start by showing you a music clip. This is a clip from a film about a singer called Zahava Ben. Um, the film is called Zahava Ben, A Solitary Star. If you want to check it out, you can check it out from Georgetown Library. It is about a Mizrahi singer. I'll talk about what a Mizrahi is in a second. She's an Israeli Jew whose parents are from Morocco, which, as you know, is an Arab country. She is singing in the city of Jericho, inside territory controlled by the Palestinian Authority, in 1995 during the days of the peace process, when the peace process really seemed like it was happening between Israel and the Palestinians. And she is singing music of the great and very much beloved canonical Egyptian singer Um Kulthum. That is to say, she's singing really seriously loved Arabic music. Every, and, and those young men know all the words to that song, and it's an enormously long song. I think Inas can, re, I don't know if you remember, it's recorded in the 1960s, I think, right? I mean, it's recorded 50 years ago, and these kids know all the lyrics to this song, and they're going crazy. So to be clear, what goes on, what's going on in this scene? This is an Israeli Jew singing in Arabic, not in Hebrew, which is her first language, performing a very beloved song before a crowd of Palestinian Arabs in the West Bank, and they are wildly enthusiastic about what she's doing. They're not thinking that she's some Jew who stole their culture. Right? She's, they're, really, you know, they're just delighted to hear this music and, and to see it performed so well. And we can um, <clears throat> you know, take it for granted that, that, that it is being performed very well. So I want to talk about who are the Jewish Arabs, that is say this slide. Is that your question? Oh, my question is, uh, which one's the, uh, the performance uh, name? 
it's, oh, it's, it's not there. It's Zahava Ben. But you'll see it again in a moment. Um, well, in a few moments. So hold, I, I'm sorry, I don't have it up there. OK, so uh, this is um, a list of ways in which um, Jews who came originally, who came to Israel from the Arab countries, I'll talk about that in a minute, how they've been called in Israel. Originally, they were called the Hebrew term Edot Hamizrach, Hamizrach, communities of the East. Uh, they're also alternatively called Sephardim. You might have heard that, that term. Um, that means really Jews from Spain. That's from the, the, the word Sephard uh, in Hebrew. Um, Mizrahim means Easterners, plural. Easterners, that is to say Jews of Eastern origin. And then some people, uh, especially like academics, like to call them Jewish Arabs or Arabs of Jewish faith. There's a book recently came out called Arabs of Jewish Faith, which I think is quite, kind of a quite interesting uh, way to think about it. And some Jews of Arab background living in Israel call themselves Arab Jews. So th but most, mostly people consider themselves to be Mizrahim these days. But some who are sort of want to emphasize their Arab background and actually really mess with our minds, right? Because that seems like those two things don't seem to go together, right? Arab and, um, and Jew. And they are um, uh, thought of differently in Israel. And, and they're a different group of people in Israel compared to, to Jews whose origin is Europe, which is the, the, the we're familiar with in the United States, mostly Jews who are originally from Europe, who the term that, that's used, I mean, it's used in English too, Ashkenazim, but really European Jews. OK, so who are the Jewish Arabs? Prior to the founding of the State of Israel in 1948, there were considerable populations of Jews in the Arab countries, particularly or most importantly in Morocco, Algeria, Egypt, Iraq, and Yemen, but, but throughout the, the Arab world. And Jews lived in relative peace and security in the Arab Middle East and North Africa under much better conditions than those endured by the Jews of Europe, in Europe, at least until the 19th century. And they lived there from the 7th century for over 1,000 years um, in relative peace and, and it, under conditions I will talk a little bit more about. Now, Islam, as a religion, recognizes the le legitimacy of other monotheistic religions. So Jews, as well as Christians, who were ruled by the various era, uh, um, excuse me, Islamic governments who ruled over this area or parts of this area during this entire period, enjoyed, for the most part, freedom of worship, the right to regulate their own internal affairs, and they participated in various ways in the life of their societies, although on a somewhat lower legal status than Muslims, and they were protected by the state. Now, there were times of persecution. There were moments of persecution. These really had mostly to do with economic, political issues rather than really being about, strictly speaking, their religion. Let's say if they were persecuted, if they were, people were killed, if they were expropriated, had, had, it might have been, they, they might have said something about them being Jewish, but it was really fundamentally economic and, and political. Um, under the um, rule of the Ottoman Empire, which governed much of the Middle East and North Africa from the 16th to the early 20th century, conditions were really quite good. Uh, for the most part, the tendency of, and the tendency of local governments from the late 19th century, both the Ottoman Empire and then the new states that emerged in the uh, Middle East and North Africa after the First World War, there was a move toward a more modern form of government, one that we're used to, which is based on a notion th of equal rights for all citizens and no distinctions based on religion or ethnic background rather than the previous model of, subject, of being subjects of the emperor or subject of the ruler and of minorities as being protected by the state. So this, this kind of modern political arrangement that we're familiar with in the United States was e and, and was being applied in the Middle East was something that was eagerly embraced by many Jews of the Arab world, especially if they lived in urban areas um, and especially if they were uh, well educated and Jews uh, especially these Jews were very integrated to Arab life, and they played a significant role in the development of modern Arab culture, which is what we're going to be talking about a little bit more, um, as well as politics, particularly in places like Egypt and Iraq. Now, and just as an example of their importance in the life of Arab communities, think of Baghdad, which is the capital of Iraq, and think of what images you might have of Baghdad. In the 1940s, in the commercial sector, uh, sector of Baghdad, which was a very cosmopolitan and modern city at the time, the weekend was celebrated or observed on the Sabbath because the Jews so controlled the commercial sector of Baghdad 
that that's just when they shut it down and Christians didn't shop, get to shop then and Muslims didn't get to shop then and that was just the way it, way it happened. That was the, that's what life was like in Baghdad in the 1940s. And there are other, other kinds of stories that one could tell. Now these processes, this, this process whereby Jews were, were embracing the idea of being equal citizens and of religion not mattering um, was disrupted when the State of Israel was created in 1948 in the course of which, and this is really the key issue about the creation of the State of Israel for the Arabs, uh, around 700, 750,000 Palestinian Arabs were expelled in the, in the, as, as the state was created and in the conflict. Now, Israel, when it came into existence, claimed for itself, or claimed that, that it was the state for the Jews, and it asserted an identification between Jews and the, the Jewish State of Israel. Um, that is to say, Israel is there, it's for the Jews, this is where Jews belong. Um, this definition of what Jewishness was all about, which we can call Zionism, um, that's part of what Zionism is about in any case, was one that the majority of Jewish Arabs rejected at the time. That is to say, Jews who were, who were Arabic speaking and lived throughout the Middle East, they're not interested in moving to Israel. They might support the idea that European Jews get to, that go there but they're not interested in giving up their citizenship in the countries that they live in. However, the state of hostilities between Israel and its Arab neighbors made it increasingly difficult for the notion of something called a Jewish Arab to make any kind of sense. Right? It's, it's post-1948, post-Israel, that this notion that, 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 that it seems weird when I tell, I mean, I, I, I assume it seems weird when I say, tell you there's something called Jewish Arabs, you're like, what? No, Jews are Jews and Arabs are Arabs. But, uh, and, and that's why, because of the, the creation of the State of Israel and what happens after the creation of the State of Israel. So after 1948, over a period of about 15 to 20 years, most of the Jews living in the Arab countries left the Arab countries. The reasons were various. Not all, all of them emigrated to Israel. In Algeria, for instance, um, the Jewish population only left after 1962 when Algeria got its independence and almost all of the Jews went to France and not to, not to Israel. Um, the Jewish Arabs who did go to Israel did not go because they had experienced a long history of oppression in the Arab countries. They didn't go because of religious longing for Jerusalem. Jerusalem was close to them in any case. They could go there if they wanted to to visit. Um, they didn't go because they were motivated by Zionist ideas. They went because they were desperate. There weren't, many, there weren't other options, and Israel was actively trying to recruit them because it needed to build its population and it needed a labor force uh, to make its economy go. Um, Arab regimes opportuni took, you know, were, were opportunistic about the fact that Jews were leaving because they got to seize a lot of property. There was also, in, other, in, in some places, the process of decolonization, some rich Jews were associated with Western interests. They had their property expropriated. Basically, things got difficult for Jews between, in, in, the, in Arab countries, uh, in most Arab countries, between 1948 and, say, the early 1960s. And by the mid-60s, they are just about all gone uh, from the Arab countries. At the same time, Arab nationalism as an ideology grows. And Arab one of the tenets of Arab nationalism as it develops is a kind of mirror image of the Zionist notion of the relationship between Jews and Israel, which is that Arabs have nothing, Arab nationalism and Arab identity has nothing to do with Jews. Jews, Jews are something else and they're not included uh, in a way that Arabs, uh, excuse me, Jews were included before 1948. So Jews from the Arab world were not motivated, unlike European Jews, they were not motivated to, go to move to Israel by a feeling that they lived in something called the diaspora, that is to say that they were displaced somehow. Right? And, they, and they weren't at home and they needed to be home. They felt displacement, or many of them felt displacement, when they left their ancestral homes in Egypt and Iraq and Morocco and went to Israel. So it's primarily in Israel, it's primarily an Ashkenazi, that is to say a European elite that holds power and it claims a Western identity for Israel. Jews of European background, of Ashkenazi background, tend to see Israel, actually say, say overwhelmingly see Israel, regard Israel as European or Western rather than as Middle Eastern. That is to say, they see themselves as somehow being in the Middle East but not really being of the Middle East. And I think we're familiar with that because in, in, the, in the United States, 
political discussion, when we talk about Israel, we always think, you know, we're, the Israelis are the same as us, or we're closely allied with them. We don't think of them as Middle Easterners. We think of them as part of the Western world. Um, and the Europeans do as well. Um, and so they tended to regard these immigrants coming from, um, the, from, from the Arab world as somehow threatening to their identity. Um, they regarded them as primitives. They come from the East. They're backward, uh, inferior, fanatical, irrational. Even though many of them came, were very cosmopolitan, very well educated, and came from um, urban centers. They were identified with the Arab world and Arab culture. And given the fact that they were supposed to be, in the imagination of the Ashkenazi Jews, backward, it only made sense that they were positioned, placed on the bottom of the economic hierarchy, and despite the background, cosmopolitan background of many of them, they were consigned to working in construction and agricultural labor. And later, as Israel underwent economic development, they became a very low-paid industrial uh, workforce. And it's not only that their cultural background was uh, regarded as inferior and unsuitable for a country that was trying to be European, but also that it was threatening to Israel's identity because it was the culture of the enemy. Right? It's not only it's not only is it Eastern, but these are you know our enemies of the Arabs, and you're speaking that you, you have this Arabic culture, and that's the enemy culture. So um, their Arabness had to be purged and uprooted and eliminated from the people who came and fr from the Arab countries and from their children. And so children uh, of Arab background, Jewish Arab background, were not taught history of their communities in Cairo or Baghdad or Casablanca. In, in Morocco, they were only learned about European Jewish history. Their history of their background didn't matter because that was just all darkness and the only thing important was, was European history. Um, and every effort was made to make sure that, or to try to make Jews who came from the Arab countries feel ashamed of their accent because they speak Hebrew with a different kind of accent, um, which is actually a more Semitic and a more authentic accent. Um, as opposed to European way of speaking Hebrew, which is the way the Ashkenazis speak it, made, made to feel ashamed of their dark skin, of their food, of their music, and so on. That is to say, to kind of develop a kind of self-hatred of them, you know, of, their, of the culture that they came from, and also a hatred of the Arabs. You're going to be a good Israeli Jew, you should hate Arabs. Right? So you hate yourself and you hate the Arabs, they're the enemy. Um, the Israeli educational system continues to reproduce or help to reproduce the dominance of the Ashkenazi and keep the Mizrahim in a subordinate position. So they still tend to be concentrated in poor outlying towns in Israel, not the main towns. That is to say, in, you know, they're not in the Washington, D.C.s and the New Yorks. They're in the, I don't know, whatever you consider to be remote you know, cities that are, not, that are less important. Like, like you know, they're living in Arkansas, say, right? Um, or they live in, ver in slum-like conditions in uh, major cities. And today, over uh, although my, the figures are not um, exact, but the, it's, today it's still estimated that about over 50% of the Jews, Jewish citizens of Israel, are of Eastern and mostly Arab background. Like the majority of the Jewish citizens of this state, which we regard as Western and European, the majority of them are actually third world. And if you add the Arabs, we'll talk about them. It's a majority third world population in a certain sense, but that's not the image that it has of itself, and that's not the image that we have of it. Uh, in the United States. Um, however, efforts to make them submit and to hate themselves did not entirely work, and there was, there was a lot of political organizing and protests. I'm not going to talk about that because I'm going to talk about culture. Um, Eastern Jews did not just abandon their cultural heritage. They continued to eat their own food, or many of them did, in their own ho homes. In private, at home, they listened to the records that they brought with them. Let's say the LPs, you remember what those are? From, they brought the, with them from the, from the Arab world. Um, they played the music from the Arab world and sang, played and sang at parties in their poor ethnic neighborhoods where Jews from all over the Middle East were uh, congregated. So, it wasn't, so you had people from Morocco and, and Iraq and Kurdistan and so on and so forth all living in these neighborhoods. Um, and music groups began to form uh, to play for these events and what came, became to be known as Mizrahi music. And, um, from Mizrahim, Mizrahi music, later known as Israeli Mediterranean music, uh, developed in these, uh, in, in these neighborhoods and by these neighborhood ensembles, where they would play music from throughout the Middle East, from Kurdistan, from Morocco, from Iraq, 
um, depending on the wedding they were playing for, they would combine it with what is called Israeli music. Um, they would add Greek elements. They would add rock and roll. Um, but, and, and so it's a kind of a, a combination of, of lots of different influences. But the singers who were most appreciated were the ones who sang in Eastern style, which you're going to hear in, I promise you, in just a minute. So around 1973 or, four, or, 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 uh, 73 or so, the cassette revolution was happening throughout the world. And what this meant is that these bands that were playing at wedding parties could be taped and could be taped cheaply. And the tapes, the cassettes, could be copied cheaply and circulated around. And that's what happened. And, they, and, and, and there was one in particular, a legendary one, that got circulated around. And somebody had the bright idea, oh, I should start a company and set up a studio and make money off of this. And that happened. Um, and then they began to sell outside of official networks, not in major department stores, not played on radio, but in neighborhood markets and bazaars and at the main bus station in Tel Aviv and so on. Um, and this music developed as a recorded um, phenomenon. And the sound was mostly, of this early music, was mostly kind of had a Greek sound, that it, which was a way of sounding a bit oriental, right? It didn't sound Polish, right? You don't want to sound Polish. You want to sound Russian, you want to sound Mediterranean, but it was dangerous politically to sound too Arab. But you had so, so you had some Arab elements. So it's Greek, it's Mediterranean, it kind of has this flavor. So let me play you one of the first hits that comes out of this um, uh, um, cassette revolution. Now that percussion is Arab. Instruments, the the. Music, I mean, it sounds Greek, if you know what Greek music is. How's this sound? Should it be a little louder, or is it okay? Um, so you can hear the percussion is Middle Eastern, right? The singing is Greek style, but it's not exactly, I mean, he's singing in Hebrew, he's singing Hebrew that it's more Semitic sounding Hebrew than the European, so it has this Eastern flavor. Uh, electric guitar is playing what, and I think there's an electric guitar and a, and a bazooki there. So it's got a little bit of rock, it's got a little bit of Greek, it's this kind of hodgepodge, but uh, very different than what you heard performed by, and uh, what was called Israeli music. Right. Not, it's not music coming out of Eastern Europe, not something like that. And it's not Western classical music, right? It's something very different and it's very, very popular in Mizrahi communities. Um, and soon, not sure exactly when this happens, it becomes popular in, among Palestinians, particularly Palestinians living in the occupied territories. Israel occupied the West Bank and Gaza, the other part of Palestine that was not taken over in 1948, in 1967. People living under military, Palestinian Arabs living under military occupation are liking this music produced by Jews who have this Arab background and they're consuming it, including Palestinians who are throwing rocks at Israelis to protest the occupation. Um, <clears throat> now, in 1984, uh, a song came out by a guy named uh, Hai Moshe, which has more of an Arab feel. Um, this was a hit in Israel, really, and it started, it was, it was when this music started to, to get out of the bazaars and the neighborhood markets, off the cassettes, and into the, on the airwaves. So this song gets played on Israeli radio, and um, Arabs living in the surrounding countries listen to it, and they love it. So the, the singer named Haim Moshe uh, got a lot of all kinds of fan letters from the Arab world saying, you know, this is fantastic. I mean, it was a kind of unprecedented uh, event. Um, so let me play you some of this. Hi, Moshe. Oh, okay. Let's do let's do that again.
doing this long introduction and then this singing. It's totally Arab kind of a thing to do. It takes them a long time to get into the song, right? It's, you have to wait. Okay, um, so big, this, is, this is a hit in Israel, very big hit among the Mizrahim, and a hit with many Arabs living outside of, uh, it, living, living outside of Israel and in countries that are technically speaking at war with Israel. And, and, and the citizens are writing letters to Israel. I don't know how they're getting to Israel exactly at this time, uh, but they're getting there somehow, and they're you know, fan letters, and we love you, and you're great, and so on and so forth. This is, I mean, th and this is not the only time that this has happened, but this is one of the more exceptional occasions when something like this. Um, happened. Now, Zahava Ben, who you're going to see her, her name written in, in a minute, um, who you saw perform in Jericho at the beginning, she was born in 1968. Her father was an oud player. The oud is the Arabic lute, and the name lute in English comes from al oud, the Arabic. Um, he was an oud player who immigrated to Israel, and because of the um, uh, uh, discrimination, against the kind of music that he played, he was unable to get a full-time job. He had a full-time job doing this in Morocco, couldn't get a full-time job uh, playing this music um, in Israel. But, so he played it at parties and at home and so on and so forth. And Zahava uh, Behen grew up in the impoverished neighborhood of Beersheba, which is in the south of the country um, where they lived, listening to her dad play the oud, listening to the records that he had brought with him from Morocco, including and particularly Um Kalsum. Um, and she listened to the neighborhood bands that were playing at parties um, and weddings. And she studied the cassettes very carefully to learn her vocal style. There were no institutions in Israel at all that could teach someone how to sing and play music. There are lots of institutes to teach you how to play Western classical violin. No support, no institutional support at all for playing Eastern music, which is a, uh, a, a great um, art form, but it wasn't supported in Israel. So she learned this on her own. Um, and in 1990, she burst onto the scene with what was called the Turkish melody. It became, she was part of a trend where it became popular to move away from doing Greek style melodies to Turkish melodies. It's kind of a, a little bit of a radical move culturally, right? Because you're, you're, it's sounding more Eastern, it's sounding more Middle Eastern than, uh, than Greek. And um, the song she did was called Tipat Mazal, A Drop of Luck, and I'll play a little bit of that. Middle Eastern music takes forever to get the vocals. You have to have patience to listen to it. have to take my word for that, for it, that that, that it sounds very Turkish. Um, you, Greek might familiar, be familiar to Turkish, maybe not so much. 
In any case, she's part of this trend in uh, Mizrahi and Israeli music uh, that is called that people call a Turkish trend. Some of the European cultural elite didn't like this. We're getting too Middle Eastern here. It made them nervous, but nonetheless, it was quite popular. And the music performed by Mizrahim, especially by Zahava Ben in the early 90s, is getting more uh, airplay and it's becoming more mainstream in, um, in Israel. Um, okay, in 1995. Um, the year when, uh, when that uh, scene you saw at the beginning was recorded in Jericho of Zahava Ben performing before Palestinian um, Arabs. That was in the era of the very tenuous pre peace process that was going on in the 19, uh, 1990s. In 1993, peace treaty was signed between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Um, and the next year, uh, Palestinians got control of some of the territory in the West, uh, occupied West Bank, including Jericho, which was the first, supposed to be the first capital, which is right on the, on the Jordan River. Um, in 1994, there's a peace, pro, uh, a peace treaty signed with, between Israel and Jordan. Um, the fact that this is going on seems to be part of what motivates Sahaba Band to, to go further in the direction of Eastern music. And she puts out this album, an album of Arab song, Arabic songs that includes some repertoire from Um Kalsum. Now, Um Kalsum, Again, is is I don't know. Some people considered her, her to be as as important in Egypt as say the Sphinx or something. I mean, she's just this timeless entity. Beyond, you know, it's like you, if you add up the the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and Bob Dylan and Frank Sinatra and Louis Armstrong and a few others, that would that would sort of begin to capture what the, the importance of Um Kulthum. But you can't really you can't really make comparisons. Um, and then she puts out an album. Uh, oh, okay, and, and this is the this is the first album. And this, you can't see it very well because it's not a very good reproduction. But what this shows is Um Kalsum's face. And then here, that's Sahaba Ben upside down, sort of woven into Um Kalsum's face, right? She's identifying, if you will, uh, with Um Kalsum and situating herself really as kind of the, as the daughter of Um Kalsum, right? I'm the daughter of this Egyptian singer. Very, very. Uh, interesting and provocative kind of a move for someone who's an Israeli Jewish citizen to make at this particular um, uh, point in time. Um, so um, in 1995, um, the Prime Minister of Israel, Yitzhak Rabin, was famously, or I should say infamously, assassinated by a right-wing Israeli Jew. Um, and soon after that happened, Zahava Ben releases um, an album called Inta Amri, which you heard a bit performed, which means um, you are my life. Um, and let me just play you some of this. This takes a while to get going, too. It's the way they are in the Arab world. To take their time getting to them. It's not just boom, boom, boom. Do they play this while they're meditating or something? Um, I can see that. Well, I mean, look, the, 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 I mean, we can, we can talk about the, you know, the notion that that, there, that song should be three minutes is just a convention. And the reason songs are three minutes is because that's the first recording technology you can only record three minute songs or two minute songs, right? 78s. So that's why we. That's why we think that, if we think that. Okay, now we're getting to the... This is recorded live, so there are people like singing along in the background you can vaguely hear.
I, I think there's some Arabs in the room, at least one, maybe two, and, and you know, she's do this is being done right. I am too. <laughs> I get to talk over it for a second. She's 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 being backed by an uh, Arab orchestra, Palestinian Arabs who are from the Israeli city of Haifa. So these are Arab musicians playing with her, but they're cit citizens of Israel. And the crowd is getting pretty excited. Because she's about to sing. I think. I remember. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna. I, I hate to do this, but it's going off. Um, <laughs> I should have. I should have cut. I should have. I should have taken a, a slightly different bet. But anyway, okay. So she's, this is again Israeli Jews singing in Arabic. Now the interesting thing about Um Kulthum is that one of the things that is legendary about Um Kulthum is that she had perfect, perfect, perfect diction when she sang and spoke. Especially when she sang, she never made a single mistake. Right? And the reason she was able to do this was she was trained as a child in Quranic recitation and singing religious songs. She had a very long and strict upbringing to pronounce correctly. Right? So Zahaba Ben, when she decided to do this repertoire, Zahaba Ben, she, she says she doesn't speak Arabic. She speaks a pretty good Moroccan dialect of Arabic. Right? So she can pronounce the letters correctly. Right? But she's not trained in classical Arabic. So in order in order to perform, record and perform Um Kalsum, she, she took uh, lessons, hired a tutor, a uh, language expert, and a musicologist, drilled her, you know, so she could do it correctly because, you know, an Arab audience that listens to somebody who's not, you know, who's, who, especially if they're an Israeli Jew and they're saying Um Kalsum, they're going to be listening really carefully. And everybody goes, you know, she just, gets it, she just gets it all right. She also went, this probably is really why she was able to do it. She went to Cairo, because there's a peace treaty with Cairo, and she went to Um Kulsum's tomb and paid her respects, and that probably got her some, what we call, baraka. Um, it helped her out. Um, so um, from the mid to late 90s, um, she performed with this, th this repertoire um, with this um, Palestinian Arab orchestra from Haifa. Um, inside Israel, in Europe, and also several concerts in the Palestinian territories, including in Jericho, but also in, I believe, Gaza, if I'm not, if I'm not uh, mistaken, but also Nablus and um, Bethlehem. And she was very, very enthusiastically received, as you saw in the film, and there are other, there are other um, scenes of her playing in other places that people were going crazy. And um, if you can believe it, during the 1990s. She even appeared on the cover of a Palestinian teen magazine published in the, in the, in the territories where she was quoted as saying to her fa young fans, I love you I lo in Arabic. I love you, I love you, I love you. Oh, I just, I just want peace. Right. So she's on, the, you know, she's on the cover of, I don't know, Spin magazine in, in the, or, or Rolling Stone in Palestine. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do two quick more examples of very different sorts of, of music. The first is, um, a woman named Dana International, of Yemeni background, roughly the same age as Zahava Ben, uh, raised in a poor Yemeni neighborhood of Tel Aviv, the same kind of environment, listening to the same kind of music growing up. Um, she um, was born a man named Yaro and Cohen. She began cross-dressing as a, as a uh, drag queen, and then uh, she became a transsexual, active, active then in the dance music scene, very different <coughs> than the, the scene that Zahava Ben was involved in in the Mizrahi 
seen, but making a similar kind of move. That is to say, bringing her Arab heritage into a different uh, music scene. Um, and she became very popular in Egypt uh, in 95, 96, 97 because her recordings, some of which were in Arabic, and you're going to see one in just one second, uh, entered, you know, because of the cassette revolution, the stuff gets spread around. And so she became very popular uh, in Egypt, um, underground popularity. Uh, the, the Egyptian officialdom was, and the newspapers were all very upset that this was happening, but lots and lots of people were listening, listening to this. Um, and this is the video of one of her songs. This is a remake of My, uh, My Name Is Not Susan by Whitney Houston. Okay. In uh, 2000, there was a second Palestinian uprising intifada. And since 2000, and, and especially since 2001 and the international impact of 2001, um, the peace process is basically, you know, for what it was worth, has, has basically been over since then. Israel has very much turned to the right, uh, to the very far right, in fact. Um, and uh, there are many more barriers between Palestinians and Israelis. But despite this, Mizrahi music still remains popular, and it's more mainstream. It exists now, I would argue, as more of a, a kind of resor resource if, if, for if politics change than as really being engaged in any kind of political processes that it was, that it was kind of involved in uh, or related to in the 1990s. But what has also become popular in Israel, in fact very um, trendy in Israel, are something called piyutim, that is to say, we could translate it as religious hymns, especially as sung by Jews of Arab background. These have become so trendy that all kinds of people are taking lessons in them, secular Jews, religious Jews, Ashkenazi, uh, uh, Mizrahi, all walks of life are taking classes to learn this. And let me just give you, let me just show you uh, one example of this, uh, well this, I'll talk for one more second. This, this is uh, a, a uh, piyut performed by a cantor he, who is of Eastern background, but I was, I I, I'm not sure exactly where he's from. Uh, Arab background. He's a cantor, that is, he's a singer, uh, a, a professional singer at a, um, a synagogue in Jerusalem, in West Jerusalem, uh, Jewish Jerusalem. Um, and he's a big fan of Arabic music. And he, what he's doing here is something that was part of the Arab or the, the Jewish Arab religious tradition was that they, it was very common for hundreds and hundreds of years for Jews to, to take religious poetry and set it to popular music of the day. Right? So, they would, they, so they would sing songs, or they would, they would write poetry that would fit with the um, rhythms of an Umm Kulthum song, or Muhammad Abdul Wahab song, or, some, or you know, some popular singer, and then it, it, it sing this religious hymn, but it's, you know, it's got the same melody as some popular song that everybody loves and, and, and knows. So this is, uh, this is still being done. Right? You can go up to New York City and they're doing this in the Syrian Jewish um, synagogues um, today where there's a big Syrian Jewish um, community. So it's common practice and, it, and it's, it's remained um, alive and now gotten much more popular in Israel. So this is uh, Moshe Habusha um, singing. Singing a devotional religious song to an Umm Kulthum tune with Arabic instruments. Some of you recognize this, 
the tune, right? This is a really common practice in synagogues in Israel of Eastern, of Eastern origin, especially when you have cantors like this who, like, who are really into Arabic music. And, and you know, they're all playing, those are all Jews. Uh, I think one of them looks like he's Ashkenazi and not of Arab background, right, of playing Arab instruments, doing it really well. And they're paying tribute to this music that they really love, the best music according to them, which is Egyptian music and especially Um, um, um. um Now, this is a much bigger phenomenon, music played by Arab Jews. And I would just, uh, if you're interested, I would point you in the direction of two movies which you may have access to now um, or very soon. Um, one is a film called El Gusto, which is playing this week at the New York um, Tribeca Film Festival, which is about Muslim Algerian musicians and Jewish Algerian musicians who had been separated for 50 years because the Jews moved to France with, with uh, independence and have been reunited and are playing a popular and, and are performing now in Europe. And the movie is just, this documentary has just been made about them. It's called uh, Algerian Shabi music, but the film is called El Gusto. And I've not seen it, but friends of mine have seen it. They say it's a fabulous, fabulous movie. Uh, so that's one example. And then the other uh, is a film called um, Free Men, or Les Hommes, Ib Les Hommes Libres. Um, I don't want to say drunk men. Uh, uh, and um, this film is out. I don't know if you can get it off of Netflix. It's played in the United States. I can't attest to its quality, but it's, anyway, it's about, it, it, it relates to this theme because it's about a, um, a very famous um, Moroccan Jewish musician who happened to be in, um, Paris, when the Germans occupied France, and the um, imam of the Paris mosque protected him and other Jews by telling the Germans that they were Jews, uh, excuse me, that they were Muslims and not Jews. And so he, he survived the war under living in the mosque under protection of the imam of the mosque. I mean, this is historically, this is not a, fi I mean, this, this, it's an artistic movie, but it's based on fact. This actually happened to this guy's very, very, uh, very, very famous singer. Um, and then went on to enjoy a very long and, and uh, productive um, career as a musician. He wasn't the only one that was saved. So this, these are kind of unheard stories uh, about relations between Jews and, uh, well, Jews of, of Arab background and, and, and uh, Muslim Arabs that are, that are kind of being revived in popular culture. Okay, I'm gonna skip over, um, I was gonna talk about two Palestinian rap groups. I'm gonna talk about one of them um, in the interest of time. Uh, I was going to talk about Dam, who were the most um, famous uh, Palestinian rap group. If you ever heard of them, I was going to tell you about how their uh, history is pretty is much more complicated than we tend to think, and how they have, uh, in fact, uh, have collaborated with um, and played for a lot of Israeli Jewish audiences. They're not just a Palestinian rap band, but I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to skip over that and uh, talk about. Let's see. Well, that's what they look like. But we're not gonna, and, and they appeared with Tarantino. I'm not sure you're interested in that. Um, okay. All right, we're going to talk about this. Um, okay, Palestinian rap group uh, called um, G Town are from the Palestinian refugee camp of um, Sha'afat, which is located just north of the city of Jerusalem in, greater, uh, in the territory of what is known as Greater Jerusalem, which was occupied by Israel in 1967 and was annexed illegally, according to international law, by Israel in 1967. It is considered a very tough area by West Bank Palestinians. West Bank Palestinians think that Palestinians who live in refugee camps, there are a number of refugee camps inside the West Bank, they think they're all thugs and ruffians because there are a lot of, there's a lot of drug use and crime in the refugee camps. Um, Israel considers the residents of Shafat to be quite recalcitrant, um, and so it has constructed a section of its notorious um, separation barrier or separation wall entirely around this refugee camp, which is also a village. There's a village there originally, and then refugees uh, came. 35,000 people live there. There's a wall that is quite high uh, all the way around the camp, and there's one way in and out of the camp controlled by Israeli soldiers. Now, if you have a card that says that, you, that, that says that you're a resident of Greater Jerusalem, you can go in and out. If you don't have that card, and there are many residents of the camp who do not have that card, they are stuck inside the camp and cannot leave. 
The only way they can leave is if they decide to move out of the camp, which is what Israel seems to want, right? Um, and so they move into areas that are under the Palestinian control, move to Ramallah or Jericho or something like that. Um, so this has a lot to do with the name of the group, G-Town, which stands for Ghetto Town, because it really is very much like a ghetto. So that's a photo, not taken by me, but I've been there, of what it looks like uh, from the outside. And this is taken by me, and this is what it looks like from the inside, looking from above down at the wall, and then across there is a very nice um, Israeli Jewish settlement in Greater Jerusalem with playgrounds and swimming pools and shopping malls and so on. Um, that is supposed to be, at least ideally, for Jews uh, only. I mean, Palestinians go there, but they can get beat up and do get beat up for, uh, for going there. So that's what life is like. Um, I met these guys and um, saw their perform when I was in uh, Palestine and Israel in June 2008. Um, they're great performers and they're great uh, composers. They were performing at the French Cultural Center uh, in East Jerusalem. Um, they also like to do signs, gang signs, even though they aren't gangsters. Um, but if you're a rapper, you got to do that. Um, and they, they rap about uh, national political issues as well as local ones having to do with drug problems and issues of, of the wall and so on and so forth. They're also committed to uh, the original notion of hip hop, which includes rapping, DJing, on turntables, break dancing, and graffiti. They try to do all these things. Um, they're not so good at DJing, but they have tried to learn um, graffiti, and so they have tagged portions of the wall, that, the inside of the wall, that, and, and that wall goes up about four times higher than uh, where they are, I think, if I, if I remember correctly. So they've, they've decorated with graffiti um, the inside of the wall uh, in, in portions um, of the wall as true hip hoppers um, with the name of their, their group and designs of the, of the kafia and, and so on. Um, and they got into breakdancing in a kind of interesting route. The, the, um, the guy in the red shirt named uh, Muhammad, who is the leader of the group, took capoeira classes in West Jerusalem. Let's say he studied Brazilian uh, martial arts with uh, Israeli Jewish um, teacher and with Israeli Jewish students, and then he brought it back to the camp and taught kids, and then they actually started doing um, real, um, real breakdancing, what you call real breakdancing. Um, and they've also, they can also beatbox, if you know what that is, which is, I think, pretty remarkable. But they're, I think, really quite good at rapping and rhyming. And I want to play you a bit of their, of, um, their song, Turuk, or Rhodes. It's another. Um, the, the, the anthem, which you just heard there, uh, I'll just give you a translation. Don't we have enough worry? Don't we have enough bloodshed? They're bringing us poison to, by poison they mean drugs, uh, for our youth to gather around, bring us poison to for our youth to gather around, and no one cares, no souls get upset, raps our way for us to express our problem. So the, the song is full of very vivid images. We fly like birds without wings. The poison is drowning us. My life is, my life is like a cigarette. Smoke rising from it every day for real. The future, I, this is my favorite, the future is a backstabbing bastard. Um, and these images convey a really grim uh, picture of life in their ghetto um, where there's drugs being sold and used um, uh, by many people. The future looks bleak. The only way to represent yourself is through uh, rap, which is what they say in the chorus. Um, interestingly enough, and this gets me to my point about, about um, connections to Israeli Jews. Uh, so there's, th this is a very political song, and a lot of the songs are very political, and they're talking about Palestinian issues. Uh, they don't think the Israelis should be occupied them, and they don't like this wall around their community. Uh, 
you know, no surprise. They don't like the fact that, that Israel provides no services, no security inside the camp. They just put a wall around them and abandon them so that drug dealers can uh, run wild. Um, this song was composed as a soundtrack for a film made by an Israeli Jewish filmmaker uh, called Roads in English or Darakim in Hebrew, um, uh, award-winning fil film if I didn't say that. Um, they have played um, as, of the, as of 2008 when I met them, and I don't have more recent information, they had played at various locations inside Palestine, or inside the, uh, um, in, in the West Bank and in Jerusalem, but they've also played on a bill at Tantur, which is near Jerusalem, with a guy named David Bruza, who's a very big Jewish-Israeli star in Israel, a folk rocker who's been uh, described as a kind of postmodern Leonard Cohen, and is affiliated with the Peace Camp. So they played with him. They played at the Cinematek, which is a um, um, venue in, in West Jerusalem, a couple of times. They played in Haifa, uh, in a city in, in Israel, uh, on a bill with an Israeli Jewish group called Funkenstein. Um, it's possible for them to do this because they have these Jerusalem, they're, they're close to Jerusalem, they have uh, uh, permits to you know, go into Jerusalem. It's harder for, for rappers who are inside the West Bank to, to make these kinds of connections. So I think the interesting thing is that they're critical of the occupation, they sing political songs, they're a Palestinian group, and yet they still do the, you know, they, they still, uh, when the occasion happens, they're very willing to uh, participate in these events alongside Israeli Jewish musicians. Of course, they're not going to do it alongside right-wing ones, and right-wing right -wing ones aren't going to do it alongside them, but you know, Israelis are interested in peace for Israeli um, Jewish um, audiences who are more or less kind of in line with the peace camp. Um, the last thing I want to um, say about them is um, to play you a track which gives you a sense of um, the fact that their music is, not all, uh, is, is also not all political. Um, and this doesn't really have much to do with the point about making connections to uh, is, is Israeli Jews, but, it, does show, but it, it would be a way to make connections to Israeli Jews if they watch this because there's nothing really political here except right at the end. It's just all about fun. It's all about doing hip hop in the international hip hop style and I think about doing it um, really well, but in Arabic. And I'm going to show you much of, a lot of this clip. Well, you know what? I'm going to stop there because I don't know why it's not, it's not allowing me to do it and I don't know how to use my machine when it's like hooked up like this. But um, if you're interested, I can try to find more clips, but it'll take me a second, but I'd be glad to take um, questions. Sorry about that. Um,